Okay, so thanks for joining us for the volunteer orientation. Um, this orientation is preparing volunteers for the monthly clinic on October 19th, which is tomorrow. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. Let me pull up my slides here. And then you let me know if you can see them. Does that work? Yes. Yep. I see it. Great. So um, we are going to go through just a couple of things today. Ah, sorry. Um, no. So the purpose of today, what we're basically, we just did introductions um, and we're going to go through like an overview of the day. We'll talk about volunteer roles and space logistics. Um, and then we'll review sort of like the volunteer responsibilities and then have time for Q&A at the end. So um, probably shouldn't take us a full hour, but I'm happy to answer questions like I mentioned if we need to afterwards. This orientation is intended to complement um, the volunteer training, like the original volunteer training. So if you're feeling really lost today, it probably means we need to revisit some of the original volunteer training topics. Um, and I'll make sure that you have a link to do that. Um, also, if you're watching this recording, uh, you can be able to find the recording of the original volunteer training on the Ashray Foundation's YouTube page. So I wanna start with a quick moment about sort of the why and why what we're doing is important and what feels like kind of the, the culture, uh, using that phrase lightly or carefully maybe, um, what the culture of this, these clinic spaces and this program should feel like. Um, I think we all know that the Missouri legislature passed House Bill 1878 earlier this year, um, which now requires, um, I mean, it is one of the most rep repressive um, voter restriction laws in the country. Uh, it has lots of elements and components. One of those is related to photo IDs for voting. Uh, as you probably all know, Missouri has been an ID, photo ID to vote state for a long time. But this piece of legislation further restricts the kinds of IDs that people can use to vote. That they can only use a Missouri or federally issued photo ID. Um, so a lot of folks obviously are pretty upset about that and feeling like, man, access to democracy shouldn't be so hard. So part of what we're trying to do is um, sort of do the two-pronged approach, right? We obviously want to change these laws and make it easier for people to vote, but we also want to make sure that we are supporting people within the laws as they currently are to increase the amount of access they have. The reason, one of the reasons this is important is because not everyone who are coming to these clinics um, maybe would have an experience that you or I might have where we feel so empowered that uh, we must vote and we have to be there in order to vote. And so then suddenly the idea is like super important because we need to vote. I would argue that a lot of people, most people that we see at these clinics, voting is so far out of their perspective because they're trying to get food on the table. They're trying to get into housing to come off the streets. They're trying to get their kids enrolled in school. And so there's a lot of reasons that people need an ID in order to like exist, let alone function and thrive in, in our society. I think we maybe have all had some experiences at the DMV um, that we maybe wouldn't characterize as pleasant or enjoyable experiences. Um, and so for me, it feels really important that when people come uh, to our clinics, monthly or weekday uh, clinics that, I'm sorry, I have a new dog. <laughs> She's misbehaving. Um, I also think she's probably going to go to the bathroom while we're on this call. So oh. just disregard what's happening and we'll pretend that it's fine. She's a naughty girl. Um, okay, so I think it's really important that when people come to this clinic that they feel respected, they feel um, equals, they feel honored, right? Like in a space of we're not here because we have all the knowledge and power and information and we're going to bestow it upon them from some hierarchical position. I think quite the opposite. This, this should feel like, wow, these people are kind of just like me and they're helping me get access to something that I don't have access to, but they do. So that space of how we treat each other, how we interact with each other, 
I know we can't build deep, profound, prophetic relationships in a clinic space, but moving into this space, not as a service provider, but instead as a neighbor feels important to me and how we would treat and talk to our neighbors um, feels really important to me. Um, the last thing I would say here is about power, right? We know that the laws and the policies and the way that they're functioning and have been in, in, intentionally designed in Missouri um, are to consolidate power um, with some people, right? And that is generally not uh, me and not us and certainly not the people that we serve in these clinic spaces. So we know that part of how we will build community power is by helping people have greater access to be included uh, in our society. So for me, this is also like a power resistance struggle space, even though it might not at face value feel like it when you're going through all the paperwork and trying to do all the things, it's just kind of completing some tasks, kind of transactional, but in a bigger picture, um, this is really about positioning our community to have greater power and make decisions over our lives, right? Over our own lives. Um, this is also part of a broad statewide effort. So we've been working really closely with uh, St. Francis community, with St. Francis Xavier College Church um, and have started to develop trainings and share materials and experiences across the state of Missouri so that more people can do this um, across the state. So just to offer that as another piece of grounding that showing up for a couple hours tomorrow is also part of showing up in this statewide effort to ensure that people who are excluded from our society are actually intentionally included. So thank Sarah, you. Sarah, Sarah, yeah. I'm sorry. I've just, you know, I've been away for four months. So what, what is, um, how, how do people hear about the clinic? And is this, this reason they're coming to the clinic to get a photo ID or yes. to have us help them? So people who are coming to the clinic are coming to mostly get a photo ID, which usually means they need to get a birth certificate and they don't always know that. Some okay. people are also coming just to get a birth certificate. Maybe they already have a photo ID or maybe they're getting birth certificates for their kids and they don't, and they don't need a photo ID, right? So that's the primary reason people come. People hear about our clinic through a handful of different ways. I would say the majority of people who are coming tomorrow um, were overflow from who College Church could receive today. So College Church does clinics on Tuesdays. Um, and usually they start calling me, people start calling me when College Church closes their doors and make appointments for Thursday. But this week, since we have a clinic tomorrow, it's just one day to the next. And I think we'll, I'm hopeful that we'll have a greater turnout for that reason. But we also have been partnering with um, some groups in North City to try to get the word out and make sure that people know this is available. I would say similar to College Church's program, which has been in operation for 30 years, um, biggest is word of mouth. People hear about it because someone tells someone who tells someone, and then they call. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the general thing that happens, this answers your question, I should have clicked slides, is that people can get a Missouri birth certificate, an out-of-state birth certificate, or a Missouri photo ID. And I wanna be sure that we're clear, that you're clear, that we're all clear, that we don't give or issue those documents because those are government issued documents and I'm a non-governmental agency. So what we're actually doing is giving people education and information so they know how to advocate for themselves in the process and spaces that they will need to engage in in order to get those documents. And we also offer financial support. So we'll pay the cost of those documents if it's helpful. It also requires a solid dose of creativity in some cases. We've been seeing a lot of folks who are unhoused um, or who are in transition. And when you need to get a birth certificate so that you can get a photo ID, you need two documents with your name on it in order to get your birth certificate. And for, so for someone who's unhoused or someone who was um, recently moved or who was impacted by the floods, coming up with two documents requires some patience and some creative thinking on the part of the volunteers to figure out what we can come up with that can help this person have access to those spaces. We're also able to give out bus fares. Um, currently we're issuing four bus fares per person, which theoretically should help them get to and from the vital records office and or city hall. So the clinic hours, like I mentioned, are 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Volunteer shifts start an hour before 
and go and are scheduled for an hour later. Um, takedown does not usually take us an hour, so uh, has yet to take us one hour. So the nine to 10 o'clock hour is set up. We'll be preparing the space, usually just some final things there, kind of getting everything ready. Volunteers, I mean, participants start coming at 10. On clinic days, there's no appointments. So generally what we saw last time was a pretty big, like a maybe not right at 10, but by 11, like a, most of the people were there by that point and then trickled off throughout the day. So um, ideally we would have 12 volunteers per shift. That sounds like a lot, but I'll get into the roles so you can see why that's important. We are definitely not at 12 volunteers for each shift tomorrow. So um, we will be a little bit short staffed, definitely first thing in the morning. We have a pretty strong team in the middle of the day and then we'll be a little bit lighter staffed in the afternoon. But again, I feel a little less worried about that because having the majority of folks right at 11 feels like following the pattern of when folks usually arrive. Um, I will have a light lunch served um, tomorrow at about noon for anyone, for any of the volunteers who are present. I think this time it's Mediterranean food like hummus and falafel and things like that. So you're welcome to bring something else, but know that um, I'll have those snacks available. So what is the general process of when someone comes to the clinic, they walk into the building, um, they are gonna go through an intake uh, table space. And we have a form, so I'm going to go through the details of this. So I'm going to start big and then break it down, right? So there's an intake, they'll check in, and then they wait if they need to wait. Otherwise, they'll be um, matched with an application support team or person. So then they'll go through application support, which is working through what documents do you need? How do we get them? How do we come up with everything? Do we need financial assistance? Blah, blah, blah. Then we move to financial support. That's where Throughout the whole process, the guest should stay at the application support table. The volunteer will come see me for financial support, for signatures, or copies and scanning. That's in a separate room. I'll show, um, we'll get to all of it. I'm just giving the overview. We, in the past, have had League of Women Voters available for voter registration. Um, tomorrow, we won't have that, but I'm planning to have a laptop available so that if someone wants to, quote, do it themselves, they can have access to a computer and internet in order to check their voter registra registration status themselves, um, which is not voter registration solicitation. So if I you're can, unfamiliar, why make a point about that? Yeah. <laughs> we can come back to it. Go ahead, Victoria. I can bring some cards and stuff with me tomorrow. I don't know if you have anybody after I leave who's um, registered oh, themselves, but certainly first thing I can do it. That would be really great. And I'm pretty sure I have someone who's a, solic a registered solicitor. Yeah. Um, and also I should probably just register at this point, but. Well, honestly, you, you're you gonna have to do it again the day after the election. So at this point, right. since you missed the deadline, I would wait. Right. Um, I'm and also then we have a, a quick checkout. Um, oh, it check sounds out. like, was that Beverly? Is yes, also I'm also a registered solicitor. Yeah. Oh, great. I'm so sorry, Beverly, I didn't have my whole camera, my screen open. I didn't even see you were here. Hello. I was late. I was late, so it's okay. No worries. Okay, so let's go into an another layer of details. Volunteers throughout all of this process, like you shouldn't have to bring anything um, and you shouldn't have to like have stuff memorized. So if you're panicking about that, I can quell that fear now because everything that you need will be provided at the clinic. So I have um, volunteer binders, which I usually have on hand, which I don't. The volunteer binder is sort of your primary tool. It guides you through the whole process. It has copies of every document that you'll need, except out-of-state birth certificates. You come see those. There's a whole separate process for that because I wasn't going to include 50 birth certificates in uh, applications in, in every binder. We have those in the admin table. But the binder also has um, the flow charts. And those are probably your primary tool that walks you through the process of what is required for each document. So it's all spelled out for you. The other thing that folks have been uh, really, that we used last time and I modified again with some input from folks who've been helping on the weekday clinics is this application support checklist, which is a yellow sheet. We're going to get into that. It really walks you through each step or stage of what you're supposed to do with the individual who comes in. Um, we have laptops available and there's like a project website that has 
additional tools or resources, but generally speaking, you wouldn't need a laptop. Um, and I think some people felt a little bit more comfortable not having the laptop. So like at our weekly clinics, um, we don't use laptops unless we need to look something up or pull something off. So the volunteers just sit with a binder and um, some like general office supplies. You also have the tools of each other. So if we have enough volunteers or not enough guests and we can pair up, then I will try to match like two volunteers together because sometimes it's helpful to have two people working with one individual to sort of um, familiarize with the process. Um, and then I will also be there. I don't think we will have anyone from St. Francis Xavier there tomorrow, um, but they have been available in the past. So the yellow sheet is this checklist. I don't expect you to see it here. I'm gonna get into, I'm gonna blow it up here in a bigger screen. Um, but this is what is handed out at the registration, at the check-in table, intake. And at intake, volunteers are gonna fill out this very first part. This top part of the form has some basic information about name, phone number, date of birth, zip code. And then we have some other details. So before I start asking all the other questions, I usually like to preface with an explainer. Um, and this is written um, in a guide that I'll show you. Um, that kind of says like, hey, um, we have some other questions to ask you because we don't like the laws the way they are. We think it should be easier for people to have access to their, uh, their own identification documents. So we'd like to gather some data that will help us advocate to change these laws. None of it will be, like um, none of your personal information will be revealed. We'll keep it totally confidential. Um, so, but there's no obligation for you to answer. So those questions are, what are your preferred pronouns? And what are your, what is your, how would you describe your racial or ethnic identity? Sometimes you'll have to, as the volunteer, you'll have to maybe model that because not everyone is familiar with that language. So if I say like, oh, what are your preferred pronouns? And you kind of get the like blank stare. I quickly say, for example, I identify as a female and my preferred pronouns are she, her. And that gives some sort of example. And then the guy goes like, I'm a guy, right? <laughs> and then you can write it down. Um, similarly, racial ethnic identity. I think people are generally, um, generally people don't struggle with this one, but sometimes they're like, what do you mean? Like I'm American. And so sometimes folks, you know, I would say like, for example, I identify as white. Um, and then like, I try to not, what I try to avoid in this space is um, giving labels for them. The way, the point of asking this question is to get the way they identify. So for that one, Sarah, if they refuse, if they just are suspicious about why we're asking, you just leave it blank? Yep. Okay. And I don't, I mean, this is, should be a no pressure space, right? There's, this is, I, I would love for you to make the ask and give them an opportunity to identify. Um, and if they're like, eh, I don't, let's just go on, or I prefer not to say, or I don't know, then you can say like, no big deal, let's just keep going. So it's not, definitely not a pressure point. Then of course, you're gonna ask what services they're here for. So there's a series of check boxes. These would signify Missouri birth certificate. OOS is out of state birth certificate. Photo ID for self or someone else. If there's someone else, then the idea is to write those names on that line here. Um, the other questions are about voting. So we ask at intake, are you registered to vote? And if they're like, yep, then you're like, great. And they're like, no, then you could say, cool, we have volunteers or resources available. If you, <clears throat> are you interested in checking your registration or registering to vote today? <coughs> it's okay that we're past the voter registration deadline. We can explain that after we help folks or before or after we help folks register to vote, but it's still important. There will be another election in case you didn't know. Um, then the last question is a broad question for like, why? So what are the reasons that the, they want to request these documents? And that can be a really broad range of answers. Most people say, because I need a job, I'm trying to do section eight housing, they need a photo ID, I'm trying to get a new house because I'm unhoused, they will tell you whatever the things and you can write them down. And if they're like, I don't know, then you can just move on. Okay. This section happens at intake. Um, if we are 
totally overwhelmed at any point tomorrow, I might pull the intake table and have this uh, happen just at the volunteer, right? We might just like bring people in and get them to tables or bring them in and have them sit. And then this could happen at the application application support table. Ideally, it happens at intake so that when they sit down with you at the application support table, you already have that information. The next part, in fact, the whole rest of the checklist looks like this. So you'll write your volunteer names, name or names at the top. This whole checklist, the whole point of this is to serves two purposes. One, to guide you through the process. And two, this checklist, this yellow page stays with ASHRAE. Anything that happens at the clinic has to get captured on this sheet so that I know who we served, how we served them, how it happened. So if, if you're not sure where it goes, write it on this yellow sheet and it will get back to me. This yellow sheet gets turned in at checkout. So then you work through this whole thing. There's a community agreement form, which I can explain in a little bit. There's um, flow charts, like I mentioned in the binder that guide you through each process. Um, you'll wanna find out, and generally if you ask zip code when you're asking that question initially, and people are like, uh, I don't really know, you can kind of pick up on, oh, are you in transition, um, transitional housing, or um, are you unhoused? And then if they say yes or no, there's some special processes that might help uh, if they are. When it gets time to financial support, you come see me, we write it all on this form again, right? So like, if I give you checks, you'll write the check number and the amount here, right? So that everything is captured on this page. For every process that happens, someone will walk out with a next steps summary page that says, here's what I did now, here's what I have to do next, here's where I'm going, here's what I have to take, here's the check, it's all in a nice pile, it's paper clipped together and in a big envelope, and then they're good to go. So that's what this whole section is about. There are some additional pages that we can go into if you want later. There's some additional pages with additional information that we'll give them that everyone gets, but then the next the next steps pages are specific to birth certificate, out of state, or photo ID. Um, if folks are applying for an out of state birth certificate, um, generally we'll do those by mail, which means they'll fill out everything at the clinic and then it, the originals stay with me and I mail it in within 24 hours. Um, on occasion, we will troubleshoot on a case-by-case -case basis. If for some reason we can't complete a mail-in application, we might be able to complete an online application for an out-of-state birth certificate. Those are about three times as more expensive than doing it in mail. So it's really the last uh, sort of um, opportunity, chance to, to like make it happen. So, um, but we will talk through that one-on-one -on -one, uh, when there's a, when that situation arises. After they're all done, you thank them. You make sure they don't have any other questions, that they know the next plan. You walk them to the checkout table. Again, if we're not doing that, then you'll just walk them to the front, make sure they know how to, which way to leave, and there will be a place for you to put the yellow sheets. Volunteer roles then, generally we'll have someone at intake. On an ideal scenario, we have three people that are sort of in the intake category because then one person is doing check-in, one person is doing check-out, and one person is the like traffic director, right? You can wait here, this table's ready to see you. Oh, you're done, great, you can come out here, the sort of mover, right? Um, tomorrow, we will not have three people ever at the intake station. So we will modify as we go. We are gonna run four application support stations tomorrow, which means at any given moment, we can have four people applying, working with a volunteer for their documents. If we have more than four people, they will be waiting until we get, get it done. Sometimes we can have float volunteers, which is exactly what it sounds like. Someone who is sort of waiting and at the ready to be called in for can you do this? Can you take that? Could you print this? Can you make this copy? Anything that happens in the middle. Um, I think we have a float in the middle of the day, but again, we might see how much traffic we have and adjust accordingly. We usually have a notary on site. I'm pretty sure we have a notary. Victoria, are you a notary? I'm in the process. 
So Same. I won't be legit tomorrow, but I'm hoping by November I will be. The November I, clinic, yeah. You are, Beverly? Yes. Great. If you feel comfortable bringing your notary things with you, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'll bring it's those. Usually, my I generally don't just get someone who's a separate notary to like sit and be on hand because we usually sure. don't need them. Um, but I like to have them on hand, which is also why I've got my social, my secretary of state letter. So now I have to buy the rest of the things and go downtown. <laughs> That's yeah, where I, I am. <laughs> Um, and then uh, Ashray staff and St. Francis staff. So that would be me. And sometimes Christine and Madeline from St. Francis, but I don't think they'll be there tomorrow. So let's talk about the space. Um, this is happening at the Tabernacle Hub, which is in North St. Louis City. So this is the scrolled out view. So you can see uh, downtown St. Louis. Here's St. Louis University. Um, so it is about not quite two miles north on Grand. Um, from where SLU or the Fox is, right? Um, and it's about three blocks west of Grand. So I'm gonna scoot in so that you can see if you're driving, here are some tips. <laughs> and I sent this in an email, um, or I think I did. If not, I'll make sure I do. But if you're going north on Grand, you cannot make a left-hand turn lawfully onto St. Louis Avenue. If you choose to do so, please do so at your own risk. <laughs> you can't turn left there. So if you keep going, you also, you can turn left on Dodier, but it's a dead end street at spring. So I don't recommend that. So go all the way up to Sullivan Avenue and turn left there. That's where my green arrows are. The parking lot is behind the building. So if you're coming from Prairie or from Sullivan, if you can go up to Sullivan and go behind the building, it's like an alley. It's actually a street, feels more like an alley. Um, it's not a very good condition street, so just take that for what it's worth. But um, you can park and enter the building from the rear in the parking lot. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yes. Most people use this Herbert Hoover Boys and Girls Club as a point of reference. Um, it's on Grand, so I think a lot of folks look for that and then turn afterwards if you're coming from 40. Okay, parking we talked about. We are going to um, be set up, for those of you that have been there, we've done it in a couple different places, but we're gonna be in the sort of what I'm calling the triangle corner of the hub. And here's what it will look like. If you are not a space person, you can totally ignore this if it doesn't serve you. But I know some people like to have a visual of what this is gonna be like. So this big um, white area over here to the left is actually their big like auditorium uh, congregation space. And so this like triangle section where the intake and the waiting area is, is sort of like a lobby for that, but it's all within the building, right? You can only go in the building either one way from the parking lot or one way from Prairie Avenue. Um, so there's no question, like people will find it right when we walk in. There's also a security guard right inside the either door, main entrance doors, the security guards right in the middle. And they'll be directing folks to the photo ID clinic this way. There are two classrooms that we will use. We will have two application stations in each classroom. Um, so four application stations total. And then in this back room is where um, I will be. That's where the printers, the scanners are and where uh, I'll set up a table for lunch. So if you, um, Want to set purses or anything, whatever, you can set it all back there um, or keep it with you. Um, the idea is that guests won't be coming back to that part. That's a volunteer and staff space only. So guests should either be in the waiting area or in one of the application stations. The bathrooms would be like below what you see on the screen right now. They're in the main lobby, which is not pictured here. Um, a couple document reminders. Um, this gets into the, a little bit of the nitty gritty, but this is also included now in um, one of the binder pages has this, but there are some things that have to stay at ASHRAE and some things that should go home with every guest when they leave, right? So the guest should take all original documents, pages, everything, unless we have to mail it. 
in which case they leave originals with us. But generally speaking, people leave with everything original. If we give them checks to pay for something, they are going to walk out the door with the checks. Um, they'll walk out with bus passes if they need them. They'll be walking out with all the completed next steps pages and the 1878 one pager. There might be a couple of other documents that they'll, they would have also, but that's on um, case by case basis. At ASHRAE, things that we need are the community agreement form, which is the first thing that you'll do um, at the application station is go through, um, it's a very short form that basically says, we're gonna treat you with dignity and respect. Um, we expect you to treat us the same way. Uh, and basically that we will only pay for your documents once per year. Um, so if something happens after they leave today, we won't be able to offer financial assistance again until a, a year from now. So you can kind of, it's worded way more eloquently than what I just flabbed out. So you can see uh, tomorrow when you get there and um, you'll work through that and we keep that. The yellow sheet, as I mentioned, in case I'm not saying it is enough times, the yellow sheet stays at ASHRAE. Um, that has to get turned in, should have all the notes, everything completed on it. If you need to take notes about something, you can write them on the back of that page. That way, all the personal information that might be about a guest is on that yellow sheet, and that stays with me. Um, any original applications or supporting documents that we will need to mail, those would stay with ASHRAE. Um, I will keep a copy of all the checks. So um, that's usually part of my process. When I sign a check for you, I make a copy of it and I give it to you and I keep the copy, but I'm flagging it here just to make sure that if you end up with a check, you're like, huh, I don't know if Sarah copied this, help me remember to do that. And then if someone is um, I, in unhoused or in transitional housing, um, there might be additional certificates. So for example, um, if you are trying to get a photo ID and you are unhoused, um, I can fill out a certificate for you that meets the residency um, requirement for obtaining a photo ID. I don't want any volunteers to sign that because it's an organizational obligation. It means the ID gets mailed to our office and um, I receive it and then I'm responsible for meeting the individual afterwards to give them their ID. It's a really great certificate um, and expands access. I'm, in ways that like previously hadn't been, right? Um, and came through about three years of advocacy that were led by College Church. It just, just came out this year. So it's a pretty new form that um, we're really excited for because people who, who are trying to get out of unhoused situations often need an ID to do. And then you're caught in this loop of, well, I need proof of residency in order to get an ID, but I live on the streets. So here's that cycle and how do you break it? And this certificate is just one tiny way that we can help do that. Okay, volunteer responsibilities. Um, when you get there, uh, usually this is for like, not the first shift volunteers, but um, when things are maybe a little more chaotic, uh, you can sign yourself in at the admin station. I have the sign in list that has your like, where you're assigned. So if you're at application station one or two or whatever, so you can just know like if I'm in this space that I can't immediately greet you and help you get situated, you can go to the sign-in sheet, check it out, sign yourself in, um, find your role, whatever, and then go to your spot. Um, if you have not already signed a confidentiality agreement, um, there'll be one next to the sign-in sheet as well. Um, I just need one per person per year. So if you've already filled one out, um, you're good to go. If uh, not, then I will ask you to do so. You can obviously please take your time to read it. Nutshell is you're not gonna share any confidential personal information. You're not gonna talk to people about Joe who you met with at the clinic, who's 37 years old, who has 12 cats and a dog and lives. You're not doing any of those things. We're honoring the privacy and the trust that these individuals are placing in us. Um, I will encourage you to talk about your experience in the clinic space but not someone else's. So it's ha I'm happy for you to talk about what it's been like to learn or to witness, as long as you are maintaining their identity um, confidential. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Similarly, mm -hmm. um, no photos or selfies, <laughs> unless you and the guests are like 
yes, I'm all in and they're posting, blah, blah, blah. But generally speaking, we don't post selfies or photos. I've used a couple of photos where you can't see the person's face, you can't identify them. But outside of that, uh, I don't feel comfortable doing so. Um, the last thing on the confidentiality agreement is about COVID. We are still uh, masking in the, in the clinic spaces. So you can bring your own. We provide masks also. Um, everyone will be asked to wear a mask when they're in the clinic. Um, and it says that as volunteers, if you uh, get sick, I'm really sorry, and it's also not my fault. Um, and it asks you to uh, please let me know if you do get sick uh, within two weeks after volunteering so that I can let other volunteers know if they might have been exposed to something. <clears throat> but clearly it says that in a lot more uh, articulate language than that. So you can read and review that tomorrow. Obviously, primary role responsibility is to treat all people with dignity, respect, and compassion. Um, and I think joy, right? That's one of the um, values at the Ashray Foundation is like, actually two of them are curiosity and joy. And I think those values really play, um, sort of come alive in this space, right? When you can meet people and just have an interaction that neither of you would be able to have. Um, I also am gonna ask volunteers to mostly manage the handoff. So if you're coming in at one and you know that you went to the check-in station and you know you're going to application station two, you go to application station two and between the two of you as volunteers, I'm gonna let you manage when the switch happens, how to hand off if anything needs to get talked about or shared or discussed. I'm not gonna micromanage that space. Clearly I'm on hand and available to help, um, but I will ask that you try to um, transition that yourself. Um, when you're done, same sign-in sheet, you can sign out. Um, and then after the event, I will send a link to a volunteer feedback form, which is online. So I will really appreciate your feedback. This is still a growing, changing learning project. So I really do take your feedback seriously. So if you come out of it, generally day of, I'm a little bit, um, not focused enough to be able to receive feedback successfully. So if you can give it to me afterwards um, in the volunteer form, that helps me integrate it most effectively. For positive or cr critical feedback, all welcome. And you can do it confidentially. So if you really need to rip, rip me a new one, you can, you're welcome to do it online and I won't even know it was you. Um, finally, uh, after the clinic, I will send out more sign-in sheets, sign up sheets, sorry so that you can uh, volunteer to sign up at upcoming office hours, which happen every Thursday, except this Thursday, because I'm gonna cancel it. Um, and then uh, we will have two more clinics this year, one in November and one in December. What is not on this list is that you are supposed to know everything and have all the answers because <laughs> that's not your responsibility. I 100% expect you to have questions throughout the day, no matter how many times you've done it, I can guarantee you that I will not have all the answers, but I promise that together we will figure that out. So your role here is not to be the know-it-all, but to be a navigator and a neighbor that helps find answers and information in order to expand access. Does that make sense? Awesome. That's all I have for today. I'm gonna take the um, slides down and I'm gonna stop recording and then we can do questions. So hold on just one second. Thanks.